Hello and welcome to the Women in Tech series powered by Bird & Bird. In this podcast series, we hear from legal leaders who are leading the charge in the tech sector. My name is Katharina Klump, an international HR service partner at Bird & Bird based in Düsseldorf, Germany. And I'm very delighted to be interviewing Interpri Sahani, Group General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer at Infosys based in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Indopri, welcome to our session. Thank you, and I'm so happy to be here and speak to you today. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Indopri, I, I thought I'd give a brief introduction on who you are, and then we have a couple of questions prepared and very much looking forward to hear from you. So, you are Group General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer at Infosys. Infosys is a global leader in next generation digital services and consulting. What is interesting for our session here is originally you started in private practice in India, if I'm right, then you moved to the US, then still in private practice working in a law firm where you made it to managing partner. You then went in-house, so basically you saw both sides of the legal practice You became general counsel of another IT services provider before you then started your current role. Next to that, so you have quite an interesting life. You, you sit in various advisory councils and boards. You are an independent director at Hill and Brand Inc., which is a company listed at the New York Stock Exchange. You regularly speak at conferences And just recently, which I found very amazing, Infosys was recognized as one of the most ethical companies in 2022 for the second time in a row. For you as chief compliance officer, that must be quite an achievement, I guess. We are actually very, very proud of that for the second recognition in a row. And we love our partnership with Ethisphere. But more importantly, we love the fact that, you know, compliance is so much a part of the DNA of the organization. Great. So let, let me start with the first question. So you started your career in private practice. What motivated you then to continue to go in-house first of all, and especially to go to a tech company? So it's exact a little bit. I started in private practice and I did a stint in-house in India as well before I relocated to California and then went into private practice and then went back into uh, being in-house. So I've crossed the pond a few times and I've gone back and forth as well. I really love what I do today. I enjoyed being in private practice as well. And this is going to come off very strangely, but the part that I miss most about being in in-house is business development, strangely enough. You know, most, most lawyers dislike that. The reason that I moved in-house the second time was that when I was in Silicon Valley in California, managing partner of the Silicon Valley office, I got an opportunity to be the general counsel of a global tech company. And it just seemed like an amazing opportunity to pass up. Right. What attracted me to the role was the fact that it was a global role. Um, mm -hmm. I am barred both in India and in the U.S. And I did a lot of work in the India-U.S. corridor. But this sort of gave me a footprint to look beyond India, beyond U.S., work in Europe, Australia, and then be part of the technology industry, which is, you know, so much a part of everybody's reality today. So that's what sort of got me back into, into the in-house role. And of course, as any in-house counsel will tell you that when you're in-house, you also start doing things which are not strictly uh, the practice of law, right? You become a business advisor, you have discussions on strategy uh, that are outside your, you know, the legal field. So I like to embrace that as well, because it's also a learning opportunity for me. Sounds indeed very interesting. So I'm just wondering, basically, you said you crossed the bridge several times. Has the role of a lawyer in-house as well as in private practice in the, in the tech sector changed over time? And did you realize any huge differences when you went back to private practice or back in-house compared to the previous experience? Yeah. So I think I had two very different vantage points. When I was first there, you know, I was a almost a rookie. So I was looking at it from a very different point of view. But I think one of the things that has really become a reality for in-house lawyers today is 
how much technology has become a part of our practice, right? And you probably see that even in your own private practice, right? Yes. The way we, for example, look at electronic uh, discovery, um, the way we are running programs, uh, the number of platforms that we have as a legal team, uh, you know, it's uh, the automation in the processes. And I think that is one big change that has happened. Second, and maybe this was always true, but now more and more, we encourage at least our lawyers to try and cross-pollinate themselves across practice areas internally, because I think the more lawyers do that, that's how we're going to create future general counsels at whatever company they may end up working at. And then I think the other thing I would say is that probably the the in-house teams have become more demanding of their partners, right? They want more yes, value. Yes, I would agree to that. <laughs> you would agree to that. I think that information access now has become easier. So lawyers are more prepared, in-house lawyers are more prepared when they have the conversation with uh, external counsel. And as more lawyers are coming in after years of practice, you know, they also have the expertise, right? So mm-hmm. the idea of going to an external counsel then is to challenge them, look for solutions that we are not able to find because you look at things, you know, you have multiple clients that you see the experience at. So I would say those are some of the big changes that we are seeing. Technology, the way we are demanding how our partners work with us. And then I just encourage our younger lawyers early on in their career to if not go back and forth, either (laughs) geographically or between in-house and private practice, but at least try and get some exposure to different aspects of uh, of law. Uh, I I, I fully agree to that. And when I listen to you, I mean, you speak so enthusiastic of the different stages of your career you did. So let, let me ask probably a very personal question, but what or who inspired you during your career and what is it that keeps you driving? So a few things. I'm an accidental lawyer. I never set out to be one. <laughs> you know, there was nobody in my family that studied law. I come from a very middle class family and the expectation was not for me to have a professional career. But it was one of those things that, you know, a few, few friends were applying to go to law school. So I just sort of wrote that Uh, wave, if you will, and went into law school. I think that as I have reflected back more and more, uh, really, I think inspiration comes from people, one on the professional field, you know, people who've done so much for equity and inclusion um, Mm -hmm. in in our field, right? And our late uh, Supreme Court Associate Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sort of stands Mm -hmm. out as somebody who's really inspirational in so many, many ways to so many, many people, right? Not just lawyers, but even outside. And then as I think of this more broadly, I also feel that we are very, very fortunate, uh, not just in terms of, you know, having access to information, but, you know, the time that we were born. And I think of so many people who've come before us who just lost out on opportunities because they came at a different time in the arc of history, right? And what those women have done, our mothers, our grandmothers, uh, in ensuring that, you know, our generation got access to education, professional opportunities. So that's sort of, you know, where you find inspiration. And then, you know, on the work front, I also find that the work that we do is so interesting there is never a dull moment, right? You <laughs> wake up, your day planned out in a particular way, and then you're juggling through so many different issues. You could literally sort of travel the globe on aspects of law that come to you, you know, different areas of practice that come to you. You are an expert and, you know, uh, you go deep. So I'm like a mile wide and an inch deep. So that's probably the difference. <laughs> Yeah, so that is really interesting. And I mean, I certainly looked at your CV up front to to prepare for this session. And now you're just saying, well, actually, it's more an accident that I ended up to be a lawyer. That's that's really encouraging to hear. And um, 
probably that, that leads me to my next question. So as you said yourself, it was not necessarily foreseeable that you end up being general counsel of a, of a huge group. So what have been the, the key challenges you, you faced on your career journey? And probably also more interesting than to our audience, how, how have you overcome these? Early on in my career, it was very difficult to get people to take you seriously, right? Mm -hmm. People sort of looked at you, particularly in India, that here you were sort of, you know, parked and doing something till you find your way back into domestic life, right? That's how most people looked at you. And so it was trying to impress on people that not only are you here, you're here to do good work and you have the ability to do good work. As I moved on in my career and I moved into the U.S., I became very conscious of being a brown person, right? You don't face that when you live in, in a society where you are, you know, everybody's Indian, right? Yeah. And so that was another issue that you had to deal with, trying to present yourself as, again, being competent and not being defined by your ethnicity. And then I would say that in my, uh, in my career, you know, I did not recognize the challenge of, you know, being left out for opportunities or people not giving you equitable treatment because of your gender, only in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. Part of it is because we sometimes don't want to acknowledge something that is not very easy to talk about. And now when I say that I'm in a position where I, if I can say that I have a seat at the table, you know, you want to be able to voice that view of, ensuring that you know you all the women who are part of the technology sector get get their voice heard right and so in terms of overcoming them i think i would say that first of all you have to be determined right so you need some yeah. amount of tenacity to be able to to do this like you're going to stay the course no matter what number two i would tell i would say that you know participate in areas outside of your work right For example, for me, I became very active in the South Asian Bar Association, mm -hmm. and that gave me a sense of what this community could look like, right? It also gives you an opportunity as you sit on these nonprofit boards to be able to hone your leadership skills in a way that you may or may not get inside your uh, this thing. And through that, if you can find either mentors or you can find people that you can, you know, go to and talk about issues. So you, you find those are the ways that you create a community around you that helps you deal with some of these challenges and make your voice heard. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Great pieces of advice. And I, I think I have to ask you after our recording whether we can continue our conversation. I think we could go on for a very long time. One last question, which I think loops back to the intro in a way and to the reward that Infosys just won and actually it perfectly circles back to what you just explained. What is your piece of advice for others in what role can, can an individual or can team members play to best support their underrepresented peers within the tech industry? I, I think you partly already answered that because the, the earlier advice or, or experience you shared is probably already most of the response you'll give, but anything specific and probably also looking at this reward, anything specific you want to mention here and what you think you did in the past to achieve that or others have done to you to achieve that? So I think the reward is not my reward. It's a team reward. Uh, it's talking about emphasis and really sort of saying that if you think of compliance, it takes literally the whole village to, to do it, right? So <laughs> yes. we sort of talk about like the tone at the top that, you know, is driven by not just the management team, but more importantly, by the board of directors, What are our managers thinking about it, right? Like what's the mood in the middle and then sort of the buzz at the bottom, if you will, right? So I think that it's um, it's a credit to to everybody that we recognize mm. that this, this is important. In terms of your question on, you know, what can people do to uh, help the underrepresented? I think you've got to find what part of that community resonates most with you, right? For some people, it could be gender. For others, it could be people with disabilities. 
for people who have, you know, ethnicity. I mean, you could take any of this thing. And then perhaps as lawyers in particular, you know, having pro bono work hours dedicated to that is, is a big way to give back to the community. Finding people of that community that you can mentor and be champions of, right? right? And by being a champion, meaning that are you advocating for them when they are not in the room, right? So not just when you are with them. And many, many other ways that, that you could give back, right? And same thing I would say for the women in tech, right? When you get to the table, take your seat, make your voice heard, and make sure that, you know, we are also uh, not only grateful for having gotten here but we're also clearing the way for people who are coming behind us because this is an ongoing journey and hopefully you know we with each generation with each passing day we're taking steps towards greater equity so that the underrepresented are not only have representation but feel included have a voice that is heard Right. I think that's the perfect summary. So there's really nothing for me to add than just to say thank you so much, Indopri, for joining us today. It was really great to get your insight and very encouraging in a way. So thank you very much. And of course, also to all the others, thank you very much for listening. And one final comment, look out. So this is not the only podcast. There are others. Please look out for more content from the Women in Tech series powered by Bird and Bird. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Indapri. Thank you.